Well, first of all, if you guys, if you have any questions at all in here, just throw them in the chat. Open up the chat. We were doing an athlete's one before this, so I keep it closed because you never know what they're popping in on the chat. So um, it's open now, and um, you're good to go. So if you have questions that pop up, if anything sparks anything on your mind or something coming into this that you want answered or that you want to, to hit on, please feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, I'm Austin Byler. Um, we've been running this thing for about two weeks now, and we're extremely grateful to have a bunch of really good coaches popping on here today to talk about base running. Um, basically, what we've been doing is running a, a free baseball school during this time for athletes and coaches and just kind of bring some light to the world during this time. But as you know, nobody's on the field. We're all kind of stuck inside, and it's a little tough to get out there and, and do anything. So I just wanted to provide another opportunity for people to get in, learn some new things, talk baseball, be around baseball, and I know that you guys that are in here have been doing some incredible things. So I just wanted to kind of brief it with that. But without further ado, I'm going to step away on this one. I wanted you guys to just fully dive into it. I mean, yep. um, We're out. there's no, no reason for me to talk this whole time. So <laughs> um, I want you guys to just run it and, and do your thing. And, and I'll ask some questions. I got a few questions of my own, just comparing philosophies. Uh, had the opportunity to play under some really good – uh, really good base running coordinators as well when I was with the Diamondbacks from Joe Mather and Joe Youngblood and they were awesome guys and I want to hear if you guys have anything as far as what you've taken and I'm excited to hear some of these new new tactics and new strategies but um, I'll introduce everybody real quick and then we can get rolling and Nate I'm going to pop off a question to you right after because I know you're, you're eager to answer it and we'll get rolling from there. <laughs> thank you guys for popping in here this is incredible you're all having a huge impact on the athletes that you work with in each organization that you're with so um, don't let that go unnoticed. What you're doing right now for them is, is huge. So continue to shine that impact and spread that good inspiration. Um, so we've got Coach Sheets out of Gwinnett. I mean, forgive me if I mess up anything on here because I'm not the greatest at that. But Gwinnett College Baseball Head Coach, um, Anthony Pile, I want to say. If I've got that wrong, let me know. Um, Lincoln Ooh. University Head Coach, uh, Matt Tellerico, New York Yankees hitting base running instructor, Tyler Gillum, South Mountain Community College. Shout out to Arizona out here. And then Nathan Latimer out in uh, Indiana, high school coach, base running instructor. And you guys are going to get into it. I want to hear all, all we've got. I'll get off with a question, though. And my question to you guys, and Nate brought this to my attention, and it's been something that just kind of baffled me at first, was the difference between a base runner and a base stealer. And at first, I was like, what the heck's the difference? Like, it was, you get on base, you run. You're aggressive. Like, I didn't think there was anything different between that. But, Nate, what is the, the overall differences between a base runner and a base stealer? And then you can kick it off to your guys and see kind of the different strategies and the different mindsets and philosophies behind it. This is actually a topic I want to say Tallarico and I talked about probably two weeks ago. At our level of the high school, I feel there's a difference between a base runner and a base stealer. A base stealer is a guy that gets on. No, if he gets on and it's a walk, we know it's going to be a double. He's going to take second. He's good at base stealing. He has no limitations. He doesn't limit his mind to think, oh, I can't go here. He is full go all the time, where a base runner for us is a guy that's a little timid, doesn't, doesn't know if he can get it, and at that point is running scared. If he runs scared, he's going to run slower. Um, like I said, I was talked with Rico about this a couple weeks ago, and from what I gathered, he didn't feel there was much of a difference in a base runner and a base stealer because he feels they could all get certain times. And I don't disagree with that. I just – what in the world? I don't disagree with that, that guys can get bags at certain times and pick and choose. But a base stealer to me has, a, has just a different mentality. He is a go-get-it guy. He, he doesn't limit his brain. He, he just has it. He's, he's a different breed, in my opinion. What do you guys got on this? Yeah, Coach Rico, you can get into it if you want. Um, just kind of what you guys are teaching with the, with the Yankees and maybe your philosophy behind it and any differences, because I know you guys have discussed this a lot. And um, it's an interesting subject. I'm, I'm intrigued with it. I think it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. Uh. Yeah, I think it, every team is different, and I hate saying that answer. I feel like that's a that's an easy way out, but every every team is is very different, and um, I think for that reason, every every player is different. Um, I think it just, you know, I think you can get stolen bases in other ways that stats just don't show it. 
So, like, I think if I'm an average runner, below average runner, I might be able to run off certain pitcher catcher combinations depending on this tool set I've developed. But even if I haven't developed a tool set, why should I not be considered somebody can steal a base because I can go first to third better than anybody in my speed category? So for that reason, I feel like that guy could have the same mentality um, as a high level base or be his stats will just never show it. So one of my favorite one of my favorite players was uh, uh, C.J. Gilman, who's the hitting coordinator with the Reds, and he wasn't a great runner, but man, that guy like if you you know, he'd go first to third. He'd go, he, you know, as good as anybody that ran a 7060 in the country, he was up there. So, like, to me, I try not to classify um, a different type. We try to create a mentality based on the practice and um, kind of how we prioritize our work every day. Um, and I'm very, very careful to, to tell somebody he's not a base stealer. Um, especially if he's slower. Um, I think you could look at the guys that I work with now. They've gone three, four years without an attempt. And nobody's planning on pushing to be aggressive. And I get it. But, you know, just in a few weeks, uh, you know, spring training work, we would have some guys that haven't attempted a bag and they've, they've got a couple yeah. stolen bases and they feel right. like they're base stealers now. So I would never take that from them. So um, we just kind of handle every player and every team a little different. I don't know. Gillen, what do you have on that? Yeah, I'm, you know, we've talked about this a lot, Tally, and, like, I'm, I, don't, I don't think we should ever say nobody's not a base stealer because the game might dictate dictate that they can at any given moment. You know, if a, you know, if you got a guy that's 1-8 to the plate, like, a lot of guys can still suck in base for a pitcher that's a 1-8 to the plate. So, um, I don't necessarily say we have to dictate all the time who they are, if they're a base stealer or a base runner. But something that we do bring up and kind of – I like giving our guys that might not be as fast and we don't see them stealing a whole lot of bags some – some they need to feel like they are important and they can bring something to the table. So we look at it in two ways. We say you're a base stealer or a dirt ball reader. And now, depending on what, depending on, like, if we have a continuum and, like, here in the middle, we've got it split. These guys are base runner or base stealers, and these guys are dirt ball readers. Like, that can change at any moment, depending on what the defense allows us to do. So, all of our guys work on everything that the best base runner does um, to understand, like, hey, there might be a moment in the game where, yeah, he's only got three bags all year, but that, that one out of three bag, you know, all year, him getting into scoring position might be really important. And it was basically predicated off of they thought there was no way in hell this guy was going to steal second base, and they gave it to us, and that allowed us to win a game. So I don't think you should say these guys aren't base stealers because there might be a moment where it comes up and they got to be ready for it mentally. I really, I really like that mindset, Gilly. And just to go off of that, a personal experience when – when I was uh, with the Diamondbacks, we, we had a catcher. His name was Luke Lowry out of uh, Eastern Carolina, and he was a catcher. And the dude had 20-something bags, and like 18 of them were still in third. And he wasn't the quickest guy. He wasn't a typical, like, prototype, hey, this dude's going to steal a bunch of bags. Like, not even close. He was more of – he gets really, really good reads on second base. And if you are not good at holding runners, which the majority of pitchers really aren't that good at holding runners, I'm going to go. And he's going to run in your face and be aggressive. So – I find that really, really interesting. Just, just I guess, perspective on it because I think if you limit somebody and you and you limit them and, and their abilities, then you're gonna ultimately you're just telling them not to go. I'd rather you be aggressive and, and take it on your own if you got to go. Like uh, at least for, for me. What about you, Coach Sheets? What are you thinking as far as base runner versus base stealer? What are you teaching your your athletes and what's your philosophy? Uh, right in line with these guys, man. Nothing, yeah. nothing really new on that. Not a lot of meat on the bone after that one. I just think you you. Uh, start to realize that if your identity and what you teach in your program comes back to that base running is a priority and you teach everything to everybody, I think you'll be shocked at the guys that traditionally don't fall into the quote unquote six, four, six, five, six, six runner that can be some of your highest IQ guys. So some of the guys that are slow footed or heavy footed, the more that you talk about it and open up their brain to some of the things that you're working on, they may not be a guy that goes out and straight steals 20 bags, 
if they can be a guy that's 12 for 12 on delays, I mean, I think it's just recognition that this isn't – and, again, it isn't just about racking up stolen bases. It's about being very uh, aggressive out of the box, thinking a double out of the box, taking a hard turn in case there's a ball in the outfield and you can take a free 90, uh, breaking down after first base, looking right, looking left for an open second base, eyes up for heads down plays when infielders turn their back and start walking away and you take a free base. Uh, still in second base – or still in third base, I'm sorry, after a double. Things that, like, within the game that you start to teach IQ – and now you're having guys look for opportunities. Um, Tally said it a second ago, being the best team in the country on going first to third. That's not going to show up in anybody's stat line except your run column. So it's those things I just think you, you got to fully expand it, not just racking up stolen bases, but teaching teaching the identity within being a great bus, base running team has a lot of dynamics inside of it. I love the fact of the identity of the team there too, just hey, implementing that early. Um, what about you, Anthony? What, what do you got on this? It's Coach Pla, by the way, awesome, but good it's job. Not, I like the um, I saw the uh, A with the asterisk thing. I'm like, man, I got it's like some French or some Italian. I gotta I gotta get creative with it. That's all right. Um I mean these guys kind of said it all. I, I think um, you know, we, we're surprised every every year that there's a guy that might not be the, the the fleetest of foot that can steal bases just because he's smarter uh, and understands everything that we're trying to teach. I mean, you know, we go through all of our progressions and practice in the fall and, and then, you know, one of our guys that's a six nine to seven one guy can steal bases just because he understands how to get reads um i think sheets kind of said a lot of it there with some of the extra things that we can do with with dirt ball reads and uh you know uh the defense keeping their head down but i think there, there's there is a difference between a base stealer and a base runner that's a mindset type thing possibly and i know rico goes over that quite a bit sometimes in a mindset um but giving them freedom um from the very beginning saying you know and especially in the fall let's give it a shot um, I think these guys touched on a lot of it, but I feel like um, you'd be surprised that there's guys that will understand what you're trying to teach and, and, uh, and just kind of run with it. I like that. Now, you mentioned the mindset thing, and, and on my end, I think the mindset's the biggest thing for anything in our life, like on the field, off the field, et cetera. And that's, I mean, that's right at my honey hole right there. If you're thinking 2 0 fastball, that's what I'm looking for right down the middle. And um, I, I want to get into the mindset of just base running in general, like whether it's Hey, like Coach, she said, hey, we're looking double out of the box. We're running hard. We're forcing throws. I love the the eyes up on eyes down plays. Never even heard that terminology. Like eyes up on, on eyes down plays is huge. Being able to take that extra bag. What is the mindset that you're trying to instill in your athletes, in your culture as a program? And we could start with you, Nate, and then kind of just move down the line. But um, what is the mindset you're trying to instill in your athletes? So I know at least for me, coaching a little bit and, and getting into that aspect, a lot of my athletes were timid. They didn't want to go. They didn't want to push the, the extra mile. They didn't want to go take an extra bag. They were okay with a single. But um, from playing days, I hated that. I was like, hey, I'm just running their face. I'm going to make the outfield a little bit um, What are you thinking as far as that goes, Nate, as far as your mindset? As far as that mindset, I mean, we're always thinking two out the box. Um, I had a train of thought there. We're always thinking two out the box, whether, you know, hard rounds, get back, whatever it may be. Um, goodness, I had a spot I was going with that. Mm, wow, I had a spot I was going with that and went blank for a minute. Um, go ahead, Pla, I'll touch on that. Let me regain my thought process here. I'll try to, I'll try to knock it out of you. So, um, yeah, I think on. the, um, I think what we try to do the most of is give guys, give guys the green light and the freedom to do stuff. I, I, I over the last three or four years, listening to Rico and, and, and Gilly talk, um, they've kind of opened up my eyes a little bit to why, you know, why we do what we do. You know, we've always stolen bases here. We've always had guys that can run around, run, run the bases, but there's so much more to it. And, in in getting reads like one thing specifically that we do on base hits is see how slow the shortstop turns around the balls in left field. If he's not getting the ball in or left field doesn't get the ball in fast, we're going to second base on almost everything. So we, we do think too, but we understand what we're looking for. Um, I think that our mindset our, or our, our, our mental part of the game on the base running side is we're going until coach says stop. Um, so we are, we're literally trying to go and get every single base that we can get. We're very aggressive on dirt balls, on dirt ball reads. I mean, we stole, we were 33 out of 34 stolen bases this year, just over four a game and eight in our first eight games. And that's a, a lot different than where we were at last year. Cause guys kind of took to the, to the vault lead and, 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 uh, I mean, we really try to do a lot of things uh, with it, but just keeping your eyes, eyes on where the ball is. Cause the only person that can get you out is the guy with the ball in his hand. 
Uh, I think that's something that we preached a lot in the last two years and the last two falls. Uh, the only guy to get you out is the guy with the ball in his hands. So if you have your eyes on him and he's not looking at you, you have a shot. So some freedom. Love that. That's applied the first three words and you knocked it right out. So, and it's something I actually have now put some thought into after Gilly and I spoke a couple weeks ago. For me, we are always, the first three days, I don't teach how to get back. It is go, 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 go. I want to wind them up as, as much as I can because I don't want to have to push them. If I push them, they're timid. So I want to wind them up and have to pull them back a little bit if I have to. So the first three days, we are just straight go drills. It's not till day four or day five. I spoke about a couple weeks ago. He was like, well, you might, you might help them be more confident if they know how to get back right away before they know how to go right away. So that's something I've really put thought to, unfortunately not been able to do any of it, but I'm, I'm debating on teaching how to get back properly instead of just go, go, go the first three days and see if it, see if it changes, you know, two or three guys. Yeah. Gilly, what do you got on that? Uh, simply, like, our system's called the Green Line Special, so that kind of says mm -hmm. that in itself. Um, and then my just thoughtful philosophy – of anything in life is being aggressive versus passive. I don't think you, I don't think you can achieve anything great in life being uh, being passive. So, the other piece is I think in game you're going to make base running mistakes, whether you're one way or the other. And I'd rather make those mistakes aggressively. So that's just kind of how we we talk about it within our program. Love it. I love it. Coach Rico, I want to get to some of these questions in here as far as like, what, what are we looking for? What are we queuing on? Um, we had a question come in as, as far as besides the pitchers being long to home or different looks, um, what are some other things that you're getting reads for on the pitchers? So as far as changing grips, tipping pitches, uh, maybe reading the catcher's, catcher's drop. Um, Coach Ply, you mentioned the ball and dirt, which I think is the separator between the good and great teams for sure. Um, what are some things that you guys are looking for at the professional level as far as like cues to maybe go off of to either steal bags or get that extra base, extra 90 feet? I think the, the number one thing for us is to just look, um, look in general and making the habit of looking. So this goes beyond like a player's job. Um, this is like a coach's job. So like our, I want our minor league coaches to be able to start the process of being able to checklist. Okay, my, my eyes go here, 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 and here. The player's eyes go here, 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 and here um, every time, and, and which is a tough thing because when you start, you don't know what you're trying to find. Cause, but then um, over time, you get really good at picking up little things. So I don't want to be the king or our coaches, I don't want them to be the kings of finding little tips that nobody else sees. And we've all been around guys like that. I like, see when he's throwing a curveball, his, uh, his fingers do this, and nobody else can see what he's talking about. That does us no good. So, but I want to be really good at finding obvious things that are, that are helpful. So I think tips are tip a little different than like reading a pitcher and his body and what we're trying to do and how to steal. So if we'd split the two, I would say for tips, number one, I want to know who the catcher communicates with in the dugout. Is it coach calling pitches? Who, if not, who's he look to? So if we're playing Sheets' team, is he looking at Sheets every time he looks in the dugout, or is he looking at the pitching coach or somebody else in there? If it's game three and we don't know, I think that's a problem. If it's the second or third time you played this team for a series and you can't answer that question, that's a problem. Because what happens is once you start knowing, then you know, like verbals usually come from one guy. Um, if it's a guy that doesn't like to talk and now all of a sudden he's talking, you might not have to know what the verbal is, but you might, um, it might raise caution. So we start kind of on that path as far as what are red flags that could get us in trouble. And then we're kind of looking for uh, pitchers to run on. So once we go on that other avenue, I want like, I want the slowest pitcher with the highest leg lift, with the longest arm, with the worst pickoff move. I mean, that's that's the kind of guy we're we're hoping to run into every day. Unfortunately, especially in college, we didn't get that a lot after probably like 2000, 2011. I don't think we got guys like that. We didn't get guys that lifted their leg very high. Like getting a guy above a one four seemed rare after a while. I'm sure the that um, sheets. 
I've, I'm sure you feel the same, Gil. I'm sure you guys feel the same way. You know, once you start running, you kind of earn that. You earn side steps and you earn that. So um, to look at um, a pitcher warming up, a lot of times you can tell, especially in college, how we recruit. We recruit Friday night. A guy, a guy has a body to carry a workload. That means he's got long arms. That means he's got wide shoulders. So from freshman, sophomore, junior year, as that guy's developing, he still might – be able to throw 93 miles an hour, but it takes his body a long time to gather to pick off. So number one, I want to know like how quick is this pick off over? And then we'll worry about how quick to the plate. If we can have both of those things, then it's going it, it doesn't matter how good he is, he's not gonna stop us from stealing. Um, if he's quick to the plate, that gives us something to work off of or uh, uh, you know, think about if he's quick picking into the plate and can mix holds. Well, that's that's a new set of problems. So we have this whole spectrum of pitchers that can hold the running game, that can't hold the running game. And it's not about knowing everyone. It's just being able to detect where they are and know what you can do off of that guy. Does that make sense? Hey. Yeah. Talarico, I got a question for you. Um, you say you're not looking for – you're not looking for the ball, the ball in glove or hand in glove movements. No, no, no. Hands I'm not on saying, ball. No, I, I'm not saying that I won't look for that. That's not what I meant by that. I'm saying if you're if you're saying like tips, finding tips, I need to be good at relaying that. It's got to be something useful. I don't. I just don't want to be the worthless tip tip guy. Everybody's been around a guy that can pick up tips. If, if it's the guy spinning the ball behind his back, if he's a ball in hand guy, believe it, I'm watching his hands. I'm seeing if he stops spinning around here. You guys can't see that. If he stops spinning around here, I don't even – I just need to know, like, the shape. I might not see the, the grip. I just see more of the ball or less of the ball. Sometimes fastballs, to me, look like this. It doesn't matter. But I know if it looks like he's holding the ball like this, it's a fastball. I'm sure if you zoomed in, it looked more like this. But for some reason, this is what I see. And I need to know if I see a lot of white, that's a breaking ball. That's not for everybody. That's for like one guy. And sometimes I swear, I'm like, okay, this is a curveball. He throws a fastball. And I just need no more white means fastball in this guy. So definitely I'm taking information for sure. I just don't want to be the guy like, see, he leans a split a tiny second before he goes, he leans. Well, let's go. Well, it's not going to help our jump anyway. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I like that. What about you, Coach Sheets? What are you guys queuing in on, and what are some things that have really helped you guys be successful at not only stealing bags but gaining that extra 90 feet? Uh, so I'll build on uh, what Matt talked about. So we spend time uh, trying to classify pitchers, and I think once you kind of know what their tendencies are, sometimes we've seen this, sometimes it happens on a weekend where the staff shows an identity. Uh, so, for instance, little things like, uh, again, uh, relative to first base, what's the first move, especially versus a righty? What's the body part that moves first? Because generally something has to get going uh, in order to get his arm up and, and moving. So sometimes we talk about front shoulder guys. So again, they come set and they're probably a guy that doesn't have good vision out of his eye. So he's trying to see what's going on and he's going to open up just a little bit. Well, that shoulder has to move to come back to set before the leg comes up. So we cue in on front shoulder guys. We cue in on chin up and chin down guys. There's certain guys that get in rhythms where they're checking runners, and they check, and they hold, and they chin up to pitch. And, again, if we can clue in on that, and, again, we're talking about getting that extra half-second jump, we're locking in on that. Um, you know, with the influx, I don't know how it is on a high school level, an influx of the balk move, if you're really cueing in on the feet, I think you can get lost in that, and you can get beat up pretty good. Try to move your vision up to maybe the hips, because generally that back hip has to make a move. Again, if they're trying to get their, their front foot up, front leg up, that back hip, that little hinge has to move. There's a little sudden movement there. Um, so we try to classify that way, switch it around on the lefty, uh, paying attention to, um, again, with, with, with lefties, you can either go first move or something. We just call it the second move. So it's the reader, the guy that likes to sit there and hang for a minute. Whether or not guys can really do that or not, some can, some can't, especially if they have fastball grips, definitely not if breaking ball grips. But if he's reading, then we would go on the second move. Um, but – we lock into, again, what's that back foot do on the rubber? He might be a guy that when he goes to pick, his toes come up in the sky. And if he's going to pitch, his toes really hunker down. You can lock in on that. You can lock in on the lead foot. Again, if you see bottom of cleat sometimes, that shows that guy wants to come over. If you see toe down, generally he might want to go to the plate. Um, 
try to lock into head movements as simple as that sounds. You've got a lot of guys lefty that will stare at you, stare at you, stare at you, come up and read, stare at you. It's a pitch. You have a lot of guys that will stare at you, look the plate, and then go plate. It's a pick. And so you're just trying to classify sometimes it's generically, but it sometimes shows you a tip that, and that's so simple. Holy smokes. When you're trying to really break it down out here and it's really as simple as, man, where his eyes are. Um, like Tally said, behind the back. I mean, we picked a bunch of pitches this year behind the back. Um, if I'm in a high school or youth coach, man, you get a guy to second base. This is our sign for ball and glove. It's amazing that pitching coaches aren't teaching these guys to just turn and cover the pitch. You can sit there at second base all day and see breaking ball, change up, fastball just inside the glove. Um, obviously, again, like Tally said, up there behind the back, you can pick pitches in there. Um, back to first base real quick. You do have some guys that are high set guys. And if they come set up over their shoulder, uh, when Sonny Gray was at Vanderbilt, I stood down in the bullpen and I picked every pitch for seven innings because he comes set over his shoulder and we had every single pitch. We stole, I think, six or seven bases on him and then had every pitch out of the glove. So it's just little things that, that pitchers don't realize they're falling into you can take advantage of. So hopefully those are some tips that help. Yeah. Sheets, I got a question. Well, I'm sorry, I don't speak to computer. My screen. I've, <laughs> I've never done this. Uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick. Yeah, here, let me make it um, one sec. All right. Good, you're good. You're good to go. Let me know if you guys can, can see it or not. Can't see it yet. Um, it should be good to go. Hold now. on a second. Um, While you're working on that, do I have a second to ask Sheets? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sheets, you uh, said you were looking, you know, front shoulder, back shoulder. Have you ever been caught off guard by looking at one piece of the body and not the whole silhouette? Uh, no, I mean, we certainly take in the whole silhouette. I think sometimes guys give away a tip. I'm just saying, like, when you, when you have to just run on the guy, then you just got to run on the guy. And you've got to, again, take in the big picture, have a, a soft focus, and really see the movement for what it is. Again, now we're back to probably front foot. Um, but generally, a lot of pitchers, man, whether they want to or not, they fall into something that will tip you, and you can lock into that and, again, have some success. On oh, it. most definitely. I just didn't know if early in the game if – not seeing what his move was because a lot of times at the high school level we won't see what their move is with our with our one and two guy being our top base dealer we won't get to see a move before we go we'll go off of third fourth pitch I didn't know if you ever got caught early on it's back to old school baseball baby until you got some <laughs> can you guys see it yep yeah okay so um watch or just watch this guy it's just going off what she said so like, when I said what I said, it doesn't mean we won't take obvious tips that will help us. So, I'm going to just play this video through. I won't play the whole thing. I'm just play the first, like, five pitches. All right. Difference here, yep. right? Now, mm -hmm. this, I, I'm pretty sure this guy was one of the best pitchers in the country yep. at one point, maybe like his junior year. And – um this stuff happens in pro ball too. So as, as Sheets was saying, so uh, we made, so as we're game planning for this guy, um, I think we scored like two or three runs in the first inning. We had a situation where it was uh, first and third. Um, weird situation. Um, we see his head do that. Our guys knew it. Flag went off and they did like a timing pick to third that the kid on third would have been done if it, it didn't raise his flag. So anytime we saw the ear of him, we assume pickoff move, and if we were wrong, we were wrong. Um, but when Sheets mentioned that, yeah, anything like this definitely is useful. And we would use this as like a layup. This is not something like anybody in the stands could notice this if you pointed it out, which is information we definitely take. So, Yeah, I think that's huge right there, Tally, just being able to see that. It's just a subtle difference. Right, the subtle difference that maybe that's the cue on that specific guy. Now, I've got a question here. Like, if you're – maybe you are a youth coach or a high school coach and you don't have the ability and the luxury to game plan and to check video before and you're kind of just stuck in, stuck in those ways, like, what are some things that you can do to really get um, a good feel for the pitchers? We don't have – we don't have access to video. I literally watch their whole warm-up and – like I said, with our leadoff, he's our top base stealer. He usually gets two pitches in. We kind of – we we get somewhat of a feel, yeah, it's it's a gamble since we're only two pitches in, three pitches in, and no pick. 
but we get a sense of his timing and his looks. And at that point we, we go. Okay. Okay. I, I do think, and I'm, uh, I think video is more readily available now for any level. And, um, no, I'm not saying for every, for everybody, but I would try before each game. So I, I just know like probably three years ago or two years ago, I don't know uh, when Synergy came around. So if, and you guys probably all know this, but if, if not Synergy, pretty much you subscribe, you pay a ton of money and then you get like cut up video of the picture you're facing. Um, we didn't have that. And before that, so I'd start, so I, I can give you my process for like scout report on no budget. So number one, I would find the pitcher's name who was starting. So as long as you can get the other coach to trade you the starter's name, which I think most people are able to do. So if hopefully he doesn't have a common name like John Smith, but let's say it's, it's Jeremy Sheetinger. All right. So like, you know, he's a, he's a left-handed pitcher from Tennessee or whatever. I'm going to just Google Jeremy Sheetinger, see what pops up as, um, that happens like sometimes I'll get lucky and right away I'll, I'll find some sort of video any video works like I'm not going to be picky if I could get a great angle for base stealing great but number one I just want to see how his pitches move that's the priority I'm looking for um, for us a lot of times we go to PBR like if you're a member of PBR you got every high school kid throwing a bullpen at some point so for us sometimes I wasn't affected because he's a junior in college now and I don't have video uh, it's like a sophomore in high school video and he's just he's a man now and he wasn't then um, but that's still like we get a lot of information I always tell the story one time we were playing uh, my buddy at Cincinnati coach Goose is a, is a friend of mine we're playing them and their starter I had no video Cincinnati's their stadium is beautiful but their angles for video really bad they're up high so like everything looks down so you can't see shapes of pitches or anything couldn't find anything I ended up going to the starting pitcher, forget his name, his dad's YouTube page, which was filled with like maybe like hunting <laughs> videos and whatever. I scroll, 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 finally found it. It's, he's throwing a bullpen like in the summer ball. Um, I see he's just sinking everything. So we sat middle in on him, rolled the dice a little bit, and we just, we just, all of our righties just got the head out and crushed him. And uh, that was thanks to just being able to just not quit when it comes to Google. Um, if you have a good work ethic, keep, keep at it. Like apply it to Google because you'll be amazed at what you can find because we all get our, our cell phones out. And we video so much now. It could give a much better angle than what Synergy could give us. Not always, but sometimes you'll, you'll get lucky. I love it. I love it. Um, there, was a, there was a question that came in from Ronnie about um, using a, a green light system as far as like, do you guys go into depth, and Anthony, if you want to kick this one off, like as far as, do you guys go into depth with stopwatch timing for your runners, like for your Steelers to see who's a guy who's got the green light, who's a guy who doesn't, or are you just saying, hey, if you got it, go. Like, is it more based off the pitcher, or is it more based off of your specific runners and what kind of speeds they are on, on the base pass? It's funny that you say that, because as Sheets was talking before, I was reaching to my book bag to grab my stopwatch, because I was going to talk <laughs> about this. Uh, we uh, we we literally use numbers on everything. Um, we start and this uh, I I have to thank uh, Gilly and and Matt on this one because I, I learned a lot from these guys over the last couple of years. But you know we knew about the 77, 78 foot lead years ago. Um, you know 10 to 12, 10 to 13 feet, 10 to 13 foot lead, and getting your numbers from there from first to second base, and we kind of do a lot of that stuff and go by numbers. You know one three or better. You know a two zero from the catcher, things like that. Um, but we, we use a stopwatch literally on everything. You know, uh, we even go, uh, go talking about cues that Matt was talking about earlier. We find out how long it takes the catcher to get the ball back to the pitcher to see if we can go second to third or even third to home on a ball back to the pitcher. So we, we constantly use those things. Uh, we constantly use a stopwatch for sure. I mean, it's nonstop for us. Well, nonstop for me because – not that everybody needs to – not that everybody probably already know, doesn't know this, but at my school I'm the only coach – I don't have an assistant. It's just me. I have a volunteer guy. This year was the first year in January that I was offered an assistant coach. For, so for the last 12 years, it's just been me. So this has been my assistant coach for a really long time, and it's been it's doing wonders for us. But I think more importantly to understand is um, when you when you have those numbers, if you get those numbers in the fall time, they could change a little bit depending on where we play. If we're on turf or if we're on dirt, because guys got, might have might not have cleats on on the turf, but it could be a little bit different. But uh, I'd say you know 
typically the college level, at least at our level, a 1-3 or better um, from the pitcher to the plate. If the guy's a sub 2-0 uh, behind the plate, we might be in a little bit of trouble. But uh, uh, if he's a 2-0 or better, we're probably going to steal bases. And again, going back to what I said earlier, if you have a guy that's not that fast, if he's a, you know, a 3-5, uh, three, four, or three, five from first to second from 77 foot lead. We might still send them because you still got to be able to throw the ball to second base and get it on, get it on the on the uh, get the tag on the right side of the bag. So we still send guys if the catcher's off because it's not just about the pitcher and stealing bases and things like that. It's also on the catcher as well. Um, so if the if the catcher if we're watching the catcher before games and I think I think uh, Nate was talking about this before having an eye on the pitcher and the catcher before the game starts. If we're watching his throwdown and he's either high or always or always off to the left side of the bag. We're going to go uh, regardless. Even if he's a 1-9, we're still going to go because if he's a 1-9 to the left side of the bag, that means he's a 2-5 to the base, to the right side of the bag. So um, just some cues. Uh, stopwatch is important. I, I, we try to stopwatch as much as we can. Gillum, being the green light special, do you guys put a stopwatch on your runners from, from first to second, second to third, whatever it may be? Uh, yeah, so all of our guys know how fast they are from their still start time. Um, Austin, can I share my screen? Do I yeah, a... absolutely, man. Go okay. ahead. It should be it should be open. So, um, I'll do this kind of quickly so you guys can just get an idea. But um, this is just a normal representation of what we're looking for. As a group, we're looking for three, three, five or less from the pitcher to the plate, and then the catcher's pop time down. All right, so that's just kind of our standard kind of a baseline time. Uh, majority of our good runners can um, still off of that guy if they have a good luck, uh, good jump and a good lead. So good lead, good jump. So um, if they get to that 12 foot lead, so that's like our standard that we look for. Um, that kind of raises some flags for us to go, hey, I think we got this guy. So um, based off of that, like this is our 20 position players that we had this year. This isn't all of our data, but some of the data that we took from this fall and I just put it in a spreadsheet so so I could show some guys what we've done. Um, and then also looked at different, different yardage times um, to get comparisons. So we have a 60 yard dash on here. We have a 30 yard dash, our 10 yard dash, and then we have our still start time. And with us, we do a still start time off of 11 foot instead of 12 foot. Um, I don't know, I just think it's closer. I don't have any statistical scientific research on that but so the biggest thing is we do our still start times they get to know who they are as a player so once in the game we decide like or we know from our still start data like this guy's really slow to the plate like we can still off of this guy here or you five guys can still off of this guy but maybe if we've got uh, little Wayne up here, all right, Little Wayne's pretty good pitcher, right? Um, quick to the plate, maybe some slide steps in there. There might be only a couple guys um, <laughs> that can really do that, you know. So um, based off of maybe their new school lead or a momentum lead, so on and so forth. But the other thing that we did is we broke down um, first movement from the pitcher and then them running through second base, second base to get that still start time and um, basically looked at the difference between a still start and a reaction start. And that gave us our reaction time here. And it basically told me like, hey, these guys have really good reaction times, which is gonna help with that good jump, okay? And then like, say for instance, this number 20 guy down here, his reaction time was a .38, like that guy sucks. And uh, we gotta make some adjustments with that guy. We gotta say, we got to make sure if this guy's ever going to steal bags, um, we got to really work on that acceleration phase and that still start phase. So um, that's a little bit of the breakdown. I don't, I don't want to talk too much, but um, that's just a little bit of kind of what we look at from getting them to know who they are and what they're looking for um, and kind of cut, categorizing that a little bit. And then looking at those times and saying, hey, your reaction time isn't very good. We need to put that in the training plan to make you faster um, to do more reaction time still starts. Yeah, Lee, can I jump in on that real quick to ask you a question? I'm sorry, Matt. The the, the 11 foot lead that you use um, is that standard for every single person? You put a cone at 11 feet and go from there. Yeah, I just do that because 
I think it's probably a more realistic time to use um, versus a 12 foot lead. Like I, I hope my guys get to a 12 foot lead. Like that's our, one of our goals, but um, I, we do it from, di I actually did it from 10 foot, 11 foot and 12 foot on different occasions. And then I gave them all of their times. That was another thing I did. And I said, okay, you guys break down, like look at your 10 foot still start, your 11 foot still start and your 12 foot still start. And look at the different times. Like that's the difference between being out and safe. So yeah. when we at, at South, our, our lingo, our terminology a lot is good lead, good jump. You have to have a good lead. You have to have a good jump. If you have those two th things and you know mathematically the time matches up, then you've got green light. That's where the green light special comes in. It's not just we're just going to run all the time. We have to have what we call a window of opportunity, and it's got a map, map together based off of our numbers and who we are and what the defense is giving us. Hmm. Tyler, hey, Matt, we've had – okay, if I could ask Tyler a real quick question. You said regular skill start time. Next column was reaction skill start time. Okay, what is – you might have said this and I might have missed it. What is reaction? So this is, this is how I came up with this, and this isn't like scientific study either, but this is my thought process on it. So what I did tally, and this is stemming from our conversation, I think, in Illinois a couple of years ago. Um, okay. Still start time from an 11 foot lead. When their first movement happens, you start the clock. Okay, you start, yep. start the stopwatch. When they run through second base, we stop the stopwatch. So for some of you guys wondering, I, we don't, I don't have any of my guys slide into second base to get that time. The reason why is because we play in Arizona. It's like sliding on concrete and my guys will absolutely hate me. So if you have turf, cool, do it. Um, but we run through second base. We stop the stopwatch. That's our still start time, okay? And then what I basically did was I was like, hey, if we put a right-handed pitcher on the mound and I start the clock when his front foot moves, okay, like when the front heel moves or when his heel moves, I'm going to start my clock then. And then when he runs through second base, I'm going to get my time. So that was my reaction still start time. So as, as you see – like these reactions still start times are way worse than the still start time. Right. And I think we leave out that information a lot when we start trying to figure out those still start times. And nope. Sometimes I think these times, this reaction still start, like our best guy was around somewhere around that um, one tenth of a second. And like he's our fastest 10 yard dash guy too. He's our, also our fastest 60 yard guy too. Okay. But his, his 10 yard dash, that acceleration phase was the best as well. But, um, I just kind of just, you know, uh, subtracted still start time from reaction time. And then that's how I got reaction time difference. It's not, you I, know, it's not, I got, a, be all I got a question for you on the reaction time as well. Um, do you how often do you record those because let's face it we don't get the same reaction each time sometimes we have better jumps sometimes we have worse jumps so how often do you actually record those so i'll do them this fall i did them every two weeks based on when i thought they were the freshest um you know so there was a lot of variables taken into place um how many games we played that fall um, the temperature in, in Arizona might be 110. So um, how many, you know, where we were at in the fall, how many times we lifted that week. There, there was a lot of variables taken into play. So I tried to find a spot where they were the freshest to sprint. And I got two in a row um, each time I did it. And it was usually in like two week in increments um, on that still start time. And so like, okay. obviously there's not a, mass amount of data but I think it tells some of the story so um, right. I was just kind of trying to play around with it and figure out um, can we make reaction still start times better because I, I don't think we practice that enough and I think it's a big piece in being able to still bases that reaction time that acceleration yeah. base I think there's two parts of it too like first of all I like it um, and 
you know, for a long time, I think, you know, I think in college we did, like, just steel starts off the, you know, just a runner's ability. And um, here's my thing. I wonder, so, and I think that's always valuable. Like, I think if nothing else from a confidence building standpoint to say, and I trust me, like I did it, I did it with guys a lot um, this spring where I'd be like, do you know, you, do you know what you run a steel start in? And they, they had no idea, even though they just ran it. I'd tell them the time I'd say, do you know what Billy Hamilton runs a steel start in, <laughs> you know, and just, just getting familiar with some numbers. Sometimes they were far away from that, but then in the new, new school leads, they might run Ricky Henderson time. And now it's like, oh man, it's real powerful. So having that huge, I, I think, so you'd have that at this end of the spectrum. I think your reaction time at this end of the spectrum, but I think it, we could go to this end where like, I do think there's a difference in reaction time of which will make your steel start time worse. Meaning he can pitch. I'm waiting for him to lift his leg before I go versus he can pitch or pick. Yes. You know, so even though you wouldn't make him dive back, we've, we've messed around with the idea and something, um, you know, just because those numbers are going to go way down. So I don't know if that's information I want to actively give back to my players. But if you are going to say, hey, by the book, we're not going to gamble at all. We're going to just go from old school leads and we're going to be safe um, to have that information. But I do think like, in, especially in college, if, if the straight standstill running steel start was close and we were aggressive, generally it worked out. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I think having that real information. So I almost think like, the reaction time, the way you have it, is closer to real. I think you could go real and maybe even past real. I don't know if you could. I mean, there's a lot of studies done. Like, um, if I were going to mean you were going to run a race, we're going to run 100 meters, we're going to run on track, and we're going to start on the gun. That's different than us starting wherever, whenever we want, and somebody just giving us who got a better time. But if it was a gun, a whistle, uh, a siren, and we said you're going to start on on the whistle. And they're just doing – our reactions would be horrible. So I think in baseball, we get all those options. And you're right, we only – we never practice those options. Yeah, and so I was I was trying to do – I was trying to look at some of our reaction times based on, like, the synapses in our brain and how it, how it actually goes off in the tenths of the second that it takes this week. But I was basing it basically off the prep step for infielders and what we're trying to actually read and react to. But – um, what I found was, like, if you look at Usain Bolts when he broke the world record, off of the gun, he was at a .08 reaction time off of that. But the average is somewhere around .15. So I don't know exact I, – I don't know what our base running reaction time, the best one is, but I think it's somewhere around that probably .15 time with our, our better base runners, um, I'm assuming – but also with that, what you're saying, Tally, and like I think it, I think I'm with you too, is how you always talk about you would rather be moving than from a standstill, and how fast we can be from that. And I think just from a um, creating energy within our muscle systems and moving like on your new school lead or what I just call ball to momentum, that's going to allow you to have a better reaction time. Um, to have a better, you know, to have a better reaction time because you have energy in your muscles basically to make a better read. I don't know. That's my thought process. You're on mute. Our, our, our goal is to make reaction time reads as good or better as than our normal ones, which doesn't make sense, but it does if you're starting the clock early. So like, you know, it's kind of like just to screw up every stat we have. That's kind of the goal if that makes sense. I can explain that to you more later, but like, I do think, um, cause if all, all measured reaction times off the pitcher's first movement and we start moving before that, our reaction times now go negative and now all the information's bad. So yep. that's goal number one. Yep. I like that. Now, now I've got a question for you guys and Anthony, we can start with you as, as far as this goes with the, Ball and dirt. I know ball and dirt in college is, is big time, and it's and like, like we said earlier, I think it's the big difference and separator between the good and great teams, and you can win games that way. Um, what are you cueing your athletes to look in on on a ball and dirt, like to read? Is it reading the down angle? Is it reading spin? Is it reading the catcher's knees to the ground? Is it reading the pitch? Is it all the above? Like whatever you can find and, and search from it. Like, 
what are some things that you're queuing in on to read that uh, ball and dirt there to get a good jump and to make sure you're safe? And just before I go, like we had with, with Coach Johnson um, at Nevada, he would always tell us, hey, don't be half pregnant. You either go or you don't go. Like, don't be half pregnant. You got to go or you don't go. Like, either you go or like, I don't want you being stuck in the middle. It doesn't work that way. So you got to go for it. Um, so what kind of what's your thought process on that? Because I've been really anxious to hear that. Yeah, so um, it also depends on first and second base and even even third base to a certain extent. Um, but at, uh, I'll go backwards because in reverse order, it's a little bit easier. Um, at third base, it's it's pretty simple. If it kicks far enough away that we can go, we're, we're going to go. But if we're not on our front, if we're not on our front foot, which is typically our right foot, if we're not on our front foot, we're not going to be able to go. So um, third at third base, it's it's pretty simple for us. If it if it kicks far enough away um, out of the circle, we're gone. Um, and, uh, and and then we'll go backwards. Second at second base, it's just as simple as looking at for downward angle. Uh, if we if we if we're in a I, guys were talking about it before. I think Sheets mentioned before about someone's hands where, where they were. If we're if we're looking at grip, if we're getting really into it that much as a base runner, we're looking at the person's grip. We can see breaking ball, or we know it's breaking ball count. Um, we're looking for downward angle and the ball going in the dirt, and we're trying to get some kind of a secondary vault into secondary or even old school into secondary, where we're uh, reading the ball down into the dirt before the ball is even released. Um, we're, so we're trying to get a jump on a jump, I guess, if that's if that's the best way to say it. Um, so uh, basically looking for any kind of cues, whether it's the, the pitcher opening up his, his, uh, his glove a little bit too early to see what he's throwing. Um, I think uh, Matt said it earlier about seeing too many fingers or seeing more ball. Um, that we, we, If we see too much ball in the, in the pitcher's hand, we're, 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 we're almost already going to go. Um, for the most part at second base. Now at first base we have um, at home, it's the, it's the easiest place to do it because we're there so much. Um, we have a place in our dugout, and I'm not trying to give away any tips. We have a place in our dugout that we know if the ball goes underneath it, we're gone. Um, but we, we kind of search on that. But we used to put um, a regular traffic cone about, I want to say it's about 25 feet or so, 25, 30 feet away from home plate. If we see it anywhere near that cone, anybody can do this. That's why I'm using this one. This is a long time ago for me. But if you put that cone somewhere around the, the it's, it's got to be about 20, 25 feet, and you see that ball, the ball passing that, you got to go because it's going to be in the dirt. So you want to have a pre-read before, before the ball goes anywhere. Because a lot of times we're not getting dirt ball reads. We're getting dirt ball reads after the catcher's already been to his knees. Uh, and taken off from there. We're try we want to try and get our reads before the, the catcher's even moving downward. So if we're seeing the ball in flight at the same time that the catcher's seeing the ball in flight, um, we, we want to take off. Um, so I think, and I don't want to be too long-winded, but from third base to, to first base, obviously it goes from easy to hard, depending on what you're doing. But we work on it literally in every practice during every BP, um, when BP throws are throwing or when we have a pitcher throwing in, in a live inner squad, um, we're literally working on it all fall. So I think the most important thing to understand is seeing downward plane, whether it's fastball or breaking ball, that doesn't matter at first base. At, at second base, it might because you'll know where it's going to kick because you can see where the catcher is. Or you're at, when you're at first base, you can't see where it's going to kick because you don't have that angle of – the catcher and then again going back to what I said earlier about understanding what the catcher can and cannot do uh, what his limitations might be if he's a really good receiver and a good thrower but he's not a great guy that can block the baseball you know we're obviously going to get even uh, a little bit more the word would be squirrely on the base pass to try to go um, I, I do I will say that I'm a little bit more like uh, the green light special as Gilly says but we we um, we're more yes, 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 before we say no to anything. If guys get thrown out on a dirt ball read, I'm not going to get mad at them because I want them to be aggressive. I mean, that's pretty as simple as that. Um, but simple enough, one, cue, one, one tip you guys can do at practice, anybody can do this, get an, an orange street cone, put it about 25 feet away from home plate, and play it from there. If you see the ball below it, it's, just go ahead and go because it's going to be in the dirt. Yeah, I really like that, and it's super simple to do, and we all have the access to it, too, so it's something easy to kind of actionable for an action step there to be able to use. Coach Sheath, what about you guys? Is there anything specific that you're looking for, um, anything different than that, or is it pretty much pretty similar? Uh, pretty similar. I think it is a separator. I think teams that are great at ball and dirt reads generally uh, are good base running teams. Generally, guys that are good at ball – that are good at ball and dirt reads probably work on it a lot, and that's just like anything. I think you're talking about – you know, especially at first base, like Anthony was talking about, having a a, a vision, a, 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 again, a soft focus that you can see relative to where the catcher is. You can see past, again, the infield skin. You can get into the on-deck circle, into the back wall. And a lot of your ballparks will have something. There's a logo. There's a brick wall. It's where the pad starts or stops. There's, 
you know, a, a concession stand all the way in the background through the net. And you can literally just have that vision and seeing pitches that either cross below it. If they cross below it, they generally don't make it. Or if they cross through it, they obviously stay strikes. Um, I think helping our guys see that was a big uh, point. I think, again, if, I, if I'm a youth or high school coach, you're, you're just going to experience so many ball and dirt reads that you should work on it a lot. And, and you try to get to a place, in my opinion, you try to get to a place where your kids, if they think it's going to hit the dirt, they're going. And generally that's airing, not kamikaze-ish, but that's airing on the side that it's probably going to happen. But I think it's also because you've repped it either daily or a couple times a week, um, trying to not create bread lines in that drill. So if they are at first base and you're talking about reading down angle, you have maybe one guy up or you have three bases off. So you got three guys that are doing live reads. You still have all the rest of your runners in that seven to 12 foot range where they would be from a steel start. And you're having them work on literally in their mind, taking mental reps, watching the throw. Yes, yes, no, yes, yes. So it just becomes ingrained in what they do. They're always looking for that down angle at first base. And again, at that point, it doesn't matter where it kicks. It, you're going on the move. Again, if he has to block, you're already three steps ahead of him. So it's just kind of recognition that if you're looking for it down, you'll get it. Um, you know, like, like uh, Anthony talked about second, third. I mean, I think those are layups when you start to see it kick. It's the same way if you're um, at first and you're into the catcher. Again, if you're out at your nine foot or 10 foot lead and you're able to peek in and you know what pitch is coming and you know that generally fastball he's had pretty good command he's able to spot it you know up and down left and right but he has spiked you know three uh, breaking balls in warm-ups and he spiked one the batter before and you peek in and you see breaking ball not only do you know you're going you should be if you have a green light you know you're going but you should also think about going uh, first to third because he's good it's gonna ball and dirt it's gonna kick now you get a chance to turn inside turn head snap on the baseball so I just think it just feeds into your system but it's a constant state of pressure because not only does the run game force the opposing pitching staff, if, if you're a team that's a real threat to run, you're forcing them to throw a lot more fastballs. Mm. And if you're a team that has that threat to run and the runner calls when they are throwing those fastballs and they're trying to spot them down and away, generally that runner call spooks the pitcher and it makes them elevate. So now it's belt higher up. You're also a, a group that, again, at second base, uh, if you're into the sign system and you're into those breaking balls, man, you're just – you're feasting on these opportunities that these these hammers they're trying to throw, especially in two-strike counts. You're anticipating that it's going to be a ball in the dirt. And, again, they might strike you out to make the first out of the inning at the plate, but you just moved up second and third because you ran on that breaking ball in the dirt. Because, again, what what's the worst that's going to happen on the high school level? He's going to go down to block it, you get the strike out, and then he's going to try to make some pudge play that he's never made before, and he's going to chuck that thing to left field and you just score to run. So it's just about that attack mentality that you now have forced them to never bury pitches, never throw chase pitches, and now all their breaking balls have to come up in the zone. How's that going to work out for your hitters? Again, I think the identity just becomes part of the machine. If you're trying to score runs, it just becomes part of what you do. Yeah, that's really good there. I love the, One, I love the mental reps. Two, I love the fact of like – you're forcing them to come up in the zone and you can get into the signs very easily and I think just getting your athletes to understand the different counts like what are some counts that we can anticipate like just get them to learn the game especially the youth in high school level like just get them to learn the game so now when they get to you guys at that next step that next level they have a little bit of a feel going into it of hey these are some counts that I could run in or I may be able to expect a breaking ball in the dirt or something to, to skip away and even just knowing the pitcher if you just watch right if you just watch them in the bullpen Maybe you got a guy who's just been spiking curveballs the whole day. So now when he gets out there, you understand any of these counts. Maybe I can expect and anticipate that ball in the dirt. And as a hitter, especially one in like a, a middle of a lineup hitter wanting to get RBIs, there's nothing better than having um, a guy spiking breaking balls in the dirt. And then now you know you're getting a heater somewhere in the zone to drive him in. Gilly, do you happen to – I know somebody asked about the, the plyo board in here. Do you happen to have a picture of the plyo board drill um, as far as seeing it or explain that at all? Yeah, I've got it. Um, I'll share it with you. I want to touch on uh, Sheets. What you, all that stuff you just said was phenomenal. Everything like Sheets just said is exactly what everybody needs to basically do, in my opinion. Um, to add on to that, one thing that we've developed or added into our training environment over the last couple of years is what I call visual and verbal reps. So if you look at – this stems from two things. One – the mother of skill accusation is reps. You want to get as many reps as possible. In order to be a better reader and reacting either 
dirt ball reads or prep steps and infield, you have the eyes have to see it and the brain has to process it before the body does it. So when you're doing these dirt ball reads, okay, and let's say you've got seven guys at first base, one guy is going at a time, maybe two. After that, the third and fourth guy can't really see, but they're standing behind so they can read and get visual reps. So we call them visual verbal, and it just makes all of our guys to see if they're actually paying attention. So our, if you came to one of our practices, you would hear everybody on the, all 20 position players yelling dirt when they thought the ball was going to hit the ground. And so I'll like call out guys that aren't paying attention. So it's more of them trying to get visual and mental reps. So we do that in visual and verbal reps. So we try to do that not just in base running, but in like – and it, I, I have it in my infill plan too as well. So knowing what we know on guys get bored and attention spans, like I try to get reps when they're not going with visual and verbals, okay? And then um, this is the country boy, eight Oklahoma, find a ply board, figure some crap out. And um, this is what we did. So. We just put up a, a big piece of ply board at home plate. And I'll just run this through so you guys can see it. It might be choppy. So this is a ply board. And our goal is to read the ball on that downward angle, kind of like what I was talking about on stick a, stick a yellow cone about 25 feet out here in the middle and figure out um, if that ball is going to hit dirt or not. I think a lot of philosophies on dirt ball reads like this guy right here, he was anticipating too much. He didn't read it out of his hand, okay? So to be able to read dirt ball and take one or two steps, three steps like Sheets is saying, we're, you know, a lot of times we're just going to try to pick on catchers because I don't think a lot of catchers are athletic enough. I know they're not at the high school level, um, but at the junior college level for sure, you know, it, they can't block and recover that well. So – we're going to take a chance and uh, play the game aggressively in this situation um, by going on, on down angle. But that starts with reading the ball out of the hand. If you actually like just took a video camera and you put it on all of your players' eyes and only followed their eyes where, the, where they were looking, what's going to happen a lot of times is they go straight from the pitcher throwing directly to the hitter and they don't read ball flight trajectory, and that's why you'll hear our you'll hear us say all the time is read the ball out of the hand, read the ball out of the hand, read the ball out of the hand, because that's where it's going to dictate and see and anticipate if that ball is going to be in the dirt. So um, some philosophies is players wait till the ball hits or they read the catcher's knees. I just I want to be more aggressive than that. So uh, that's what we do at South. Not, it, it works for us for the most part, not saying it works for everybody, but we're just going to try to pick on a lot of, a lot of catchers in that situation. And that's a drill that I like to use. Which comes back to teaching your secondary better. So teaching them again, just a regular secondary without a run, without a steel jump, without anything, no knowledge of pitch is more of a controlled secondary, not the high school a skips Yes. leaps and bounds that their their head is literally floating if they can take a more controlled concise way to keep their head on level to just have their feet shuffle out it allows them to keep again eyes on the hand on the ball and they read that downward angle and they're running before the catcher ever makes a move that's what you're trying to go for ball yeah. and dirt teams that are really good at ball and dirt are moving before the catcher is even decided he's going to block it right those are really good teams to do that yeah i, I, um, I agree with you a million percent sheets on that because you know when you it, for all the guys that, that, that are high school guys, travel ball guys, um, whenever you guys do BP and you have base runners, make sure you guys at first base are doing this. Um, it's super important. And any, in any game, you're going to get this. But um, I feel like on their secondary leads, when, when guys are getting them, even from an old school start, if they're not tracking the pitch, they're never going to see the cone. They're going to go right from the pitcher's hand right to the, right to the, where, where the, the hitting zone. Um, and I, I'd say this as well for uh, an infielder, maybe even an outfielder, we got to be able to track the ball, see what it's doing, as opposed to watching the catcher's mitt on a regular basis. Maybe for outfielders, maybe looking at the mitt a little bit more. But um, as, far as, as far as getting those leads, the secondary leads, seeing the ball down in the dirt um, and, and dirt ball reads, number one priority is making sure you see the ball the whole way. 
because you can also put the brakes on too if the catcher makes a really good play. Yeah, getting on that, on that aspect, Anthony, as far as like putting the brakes on, I was always taught don't turn your shoulders to the to the base, like to the next base. What are, what are you teaching your guys as far as when they land? Are you going 45 degree angle with the shoulders so you can still get back and clear your, clear your front side? Or is it even if you do lose your shoulders, can you still get back? Um, like, what are you teaching as far as that goes? On, sec on, on a secondary lead from first? Yeah, it just even just regular secondary, or if you think you've got a ball in the dirt and you lose your shoulders, now you're facing second base, say your first base, facing second. Like, uh, what are you teaching your athletes? Are you teaching them to keep your shoulders square to the pitcher, to the home plate, to the baseball, or, or yeah. nothing with the shoulders? No, so I have a super loud voice, and, and my, my cue uh, as Gillies was, uh, Gilly had one, my cue was yes. I say yes really, really, really loud. So as soon as you hear me say yes, your shoulder should be turning going to second base, and we're not looking back, looking to go back. Um, the difference would be if you get the read before I do, which doesn't really happen very often, but if you get the read before I do, and you start to kind of turn your – if you start to turn your shoulders a bit more going towards second base, and you got to put the brakes on, if the ball's going down, you still have a chance to put the brakes on, stop, open left foot, and go back. Because um, you're probably only going to be about – 16-ish, maybe 18 at most. Catcher still has to catch the ball, turn his feet, and throw the ball 90 feet. So you still have a chance to get back in time. But on the same breath, um, more often than not, if we have a catcher throwing behind runners, we're going to second base anyway. So uh, you do have a chance to put the brakes on, but we're if a catcher decides to throw behind our runners and we have some kind of lead, we're going to the next base. Perfect. Perfect. Um, to touch on that, Byler, for yeah, a me me mechanical standpoint, one thing we added this year – and it was one thing Sheets touched on, and then to come back to your shoulders being turned, being straight up, whichever it may be. For the A skip issue, whenever we go into our secondaries, for a drill, I get a medicine ball. They have to hold it down below their waist, and that keeps them from bouncing their heads up and down and getting more vertical than horizontal towards the bag. So medicine ball right down the middle, get your two, three shuffles, drop it and plant and either go back or drop it and plant and go forward is one way we keep our shoulders and head level. Now, to, add, to answer if the shoulders are turned, mm -hmm. I like to go with my right foot. Is it a 45 as if it's between second and third? At that point, you're not over-rotated. You can get back if you need to, but you also have a good starting position to get a good power step in off your right being pivoted a little bit. That, and that's just a mechanical standpoint there. I like that. And I, I, can, I can see, I'm just getting the feel for it right now, just as far as where my foot is. If I open up my hips, I've kind of lost it. So, I mean, that totally makes sense. I definitely appreciate that, Nate. Um, Joe, Joseph, I know you wanted to mention something on this aspect too. Um, if you want to unmute and feel free to add in. Yes, yeah, so I'm from uh, UVA. Uh, so a couple of things that we do at uh, UVA. Our biggest thing that we teach our guys, and I know Gilliam, I know you touched on uh, like visualiz visualization. Um, so a couple of things we tell our guys when they're on first base or any base uh, is to look for a ball. If it's in hand, we take an extra step to lead. Because if he's trying to pick off, right? Uh, or ball and glove, we take an extra step lead because he's got to put his hand in the glove to pull out. Um, so our guys during practice will all, all base runners will say ball in hand, ball in glove, ball in hand. You keep your normal lead, ball in glove. You take an extra step. Uh, after they, uh, once they touch the base, they'll do um, look at the sign and the scoreboard and defense to see. All right, ball in the gap. Can I go first to third to see how the outfield's playing? Um, with visualization, we do. Our guys are trained to look for the key, uh, with just his arm at release, the angle of the ball, uh, dirt ball, batted ball, caught ball, and then read and respond uh, for every pitch. That's what our guys are trained visualization to do for everything. Um, and then on some of the things that we look for, uh, for righties, um, we look for their front shoulder um, pretty much all the time. Um, and then if they're not doing anything front shoulder, front shoulder, front shoulder, We'll look for his elbow uh, and heel. Uh, lefties, uh, first thing we look at is his head. As uh, as we saw from Reed, uh, that's we were playing them. Uh, and that was the first thing we noticed on Reed was that his head movement. Uh, so we were able to steal bases off him against Louisville. Uh, so that's just a couple of things that we do. 
uh, that I thought could help with people. And if anybody has questions, feel free. Absolutely. No, thanks for adding in, man. I appreciate that. And, and we can learn from everybody, right? I think there's something that we can take away from it all and, and maybe just add into our own little little secret sauce out there on the bases, man, just to be able to add something new, give the give the athletes a new cue, something that they can look for. Who knows? You can always find a way to get better. Um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time because I know you guys took a lot of time out of your day. And for some of y'all out on the East Coast, it's, it's a little later in the evening. So um, I'm going to just uh, go for the last question. And yes, Jeff, this will be replayed. I got it recorded. So um, we'll have that up here by tonight. But I want to talk about stealing third base. I, I won as a, as a player. I freaking love it. I think it's the easiest bag to steal in the whole game. And I think at the pro level, it might be even easier than the college level. But you guys are coaching there right now. I'm sure you've got more insights on that. What is like, what are some things that you're teaching your athletes? Because for me, I got to play under Coach Mike Roberts. Um, he could to it out in the Cape, and he was huge on stealing third. And it was all about watching the head turns, like reading the head turns. And that was our big deal, getting our skips. Um, I know some coaches teach keep your feet moving all the time. Some say don't keep your feet moving that much. I think getting momentum is huge any way you can. Um, but for you guys, and we could start with uh, just maybe Coach Sheets, and we could work down the list over here as far as, hey, what are we looking for stealing third base? Is there anything specific that we're looking, or, or what are some different things that we can cue in on? Matt Tellerico, you're up. <laughs> yeah, line it up, man, line it up. <laughs> um, yeah, so, it, again, it depends on who it is. We like to have different options. Um, if we can outrun the ball, we'll outrun the ball. Um, if we can build momentum, um, I think there are, there are just better ways to do it. I think there are optimal ways to do it. I think you can turn on big league games and you can, like, I can go through all the stolen bases of the last, I don't know, however many years. And um, you can find a bunch of different examples. I just think there are optimal ways to do it that are less risky. Um, and I think it just completely centered on, on the pitcher. I think if him, if the pitcher, the middle infielders, um, the catcher, the defense will allow you to steal, you can steal a lot. If they won't, well, then you should be like the most unaggressive base stealer ever. They're just a majority of teams will, will give you openings. So for number one, we want to be able to try to get momentum. Um, we want to be able to do it in safe areas, meaning areas where we can't get picked off. We want to have effective communication from the, the base coaches to the runner that's quick, as silent as we can make it. Um, and we want to kind of feel like it came from, just came from nowhere. Um, and I think there's a lot of acting. There's a lot of stuff that goes involved, that's involved in that. But I think a lot of it gets lost in translation. You got to remember, like, just, I've, I've got the, you know, I've been able to work with a lot of coaches around the country and then I get to go recruit in the summers where I used to and you'd see teams that would, would try to do the uh, try to do what we we're doing um, and some get get lost in translation where just a lot of moving around a lot of bouncing around that doesn't really help um, they still might go and might be safe but we're always trying to prepare for like the best even when we were in college we we're trying to prepare for like the absolute best middle and filler pitcher combinations so I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, just being an example, like if I shuffle out to get momentum to steal third, he looks, he looks away. I shuffle back. I try again on this next look, not the next pitch, the next look. He looks away. I shuffle back. I, and it just is bouncing back and forth. Eventually when, when you get to play defenses at practice, like you're getting picked off. You might get a stolen base or two here or there, but like we're in the, in the business of like, we want to be successful like 85, 90, 95 percent, which is like a, an optimistic goal. Uh, but we've got to be really clean and we've got to be really strategic. And that's kind of what I'm chasing is like the cleanest guy, not necessarily the guy that can steal a ton. Like our guy that led the country last year, JD, stole 60 for 70. It was pretty clean. And I wish I had one more year because I think we could have got it cleaner. And that's what I'm, I think more than anything, I think third base is a a really big opening. Um, but the art is teaching when those openings are and then teaching them when they're not very open so we can just stand there. And we don't have to make an announcement. We still want attention. We're just standing there. So. No, that's really good. Um, I love that aspect. Anybody else got anything to add on to that? Uh, just real quick. Uh, 
tidbit, I guess. Um, if the, the team that you're playing against is a little bit um, undisciplined in def on defense and their middle guys aren't really stopping the run game or helping control the run game, you're always going to have your shortstop smack in his glove for whatever reason. Still don't know how that why that works. We don't do it. But um, I'd say if, you're, if the team you're playing against is undisciplined and you, you kind of know that if you play them all the time, um, you might be able to get bigger leads. I know they talk about 18, 21, 23 foot leads. Um, I would say if you're undisciplined, you can get a little bit riskier with your lead, I guess it would be the term. Um, and then obviously going back to what we said earlier about timing everything um, from where you start your 21 foot lead to third base. And we don't give it away. We like, there's nothing extra that we do. We're, we're at second base. We walk a lot more than we, than we get um, any kind of vault. We're walking the whole time. So there's not a lot of, um, are we going or aren't we going? No one's ever going to know because it's a walking thing. So, okay, I like that. I like that a lot. Gilly Sheets, you guys got anything to add on that? I'll add something to it that's out, out of the norm, I would say. Um, with looking at percentages, this is this is definitely. There's probably people that think I'm an idiot for this, but um, like. Kind of like Tally was talking about, we want to be successful as much as we possibly can. So we're looking for windows of opportunity to go. Um, I think there's times when we look at that data and say, like at the end of the year, we look at it and we're like, you know, we were 85% or 80% or 78%. I don't know if that tells the whole story because I think there's micro pieces within the game where maybe we got thrown out, but it was a better percentage that, there, for example, I think this is at the lower levels. I don't think this is at the D1 level or pro ball for sure. But in high school, for all you high school guys, let's say you've got a guy up that's your eight or nine hole. you got a guy on second base. And your eight or nine hole is 0 for 20. This dude is not very good. And he's not going to drive this guy in with two outs. And he's got a 2-2 two -two count on him in that situation. Like, I would be really aggressive with trying to steal third base in that standpoint based on, along the fact that I might take a chance on the third baseman or the catcher throwing the ball to left field. There might be a better chance that the guy's going to throw the ball to left field versus this guy driving a guy in. So I, I might take a chance in doing that in that situation. If we get thrown out, okay, all right. But there's times where we do that at South Mountain, like, there's times where it's worked and there's times where it hasn't worked. But, um, you know, in that moment, that's just me in my gut feel like, hey, you know what, I'm going to take a shot right here. Let's, let's be aggressive with two, two count, two strikes. And if we're safe and it's a ball, then it's a three, two count. And hopefully we can draw a walk and we've got a first and third gimmick play that we can put in now and have a possible chance with the nine hole pull up. Just, you know, so there's scenarios that I think are – at the lower levels, high school, and, and you know, when you're playing teams that don't play catch very well, I think there's opportunities that you can be riskier um, where it might work out, it might not, but I'll take my chances sometimes. So that's kind of something I'd say. So I'll jump right on top. Development's got to play a role, right? So Matt, I, I gave you the stage. You're not going to let me take a minute now? <laughs> one second, one second. So I – I, I have to look at the scale, but I did in college too. So I had like the fall seasons different than the spring season. Maybe not everybody has um, those two seasons, but like if I had to, in, especially in college or for now, if I have a guy that's going through like the GCL or like low A or something like that, and he's got to get thrown out to learn something, as long as we're actively teaching, we're not like, hey, keep going, you'll figure it out. This is part of it. But we're working every single day to – I think I invest – I'll definitely invest a year or two. So, I, I think going with your saying, uh, Tower, is like you know, people don't take into account developmental time. If a guy's got to hit 100 in order to hit 350 as, as a junior and senior, he'll take it. But if he gets thrown out half his times as freshman, you tell him to stop running. So, sorry, Sheets, go ahead. I'm sorry. Guys, I appreciate you having me. Uh, thanks for uh, jumping on here. Um, so I'm going to jump on – I love you. I'm going to jump on Gilly's like outside the box because that's kind of – I like to live in that space too and trying to think uh, – don't, don't take the status quo. So um, I think number one, first thing is 
don't get lost in the fact that you're not supposed to make your third out at third base. Don't get lost in that because now you just you, you just hit a double with two outs and you're just expecting that green runner to just hang out. When back to what Gilly was saying, you could create some action again. They chuck it into left field and you scored them. You still got a guy to hit with two outs. So I just think get outside that box a little bit. On the other side of the base, again, I'm not saying you have to do this at second base, but definitely at first base. I had a kid this fall, and he ran in an 0-2 count. And I just – I, like, panicked at first. Like, I went, what are you – and he was safe. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. Why wouldn't you? I mean, I mean, you just got to be able – like, it's like 3-0 green lights. I, I forget, kid asked me the first uh, scrimmage of the fall, and he turned around. He's like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, just be a dude. Hit it 1,000 feet. If he throws it down the middle, teach him a lesson. And that just became part of what we did. So it, it, it more than that builds into this model, which is what I'm getting back to. I think the willingness to step outside the box and think a little bit differently, uh, not no worry it so much about, again, where you make your last out or, again, what count at certain points. But if you really teach and your kids have IQ and you couple that with an environment, especially from day one, that you continue through the spring. So hear me out on this, coaches. In the fall, we create a failure-free environment. They get thrown out, and literally it's, come on over, let's have a conversation. What would you go on? What happened there? What would you see? Yeah, maybe we should think a little bit differently about this. You literally let them fail so they start to test the boundaries of their God-given abilities. The key is to bring that into the spring. Now, when the lights are on and there's wins and losses involved, that's when we all clam up. And that's when your kid gets thrown out in the fifth and you want to break a clipboard because you're pissed. When you do that, you have killed failure free and you've killed the spirit of aggressiveness. And so it's literally, you're making an identity claim that this is what we're going to be good at. You have to, as I think as a coach, hope these guys back me up. You better get away from, from reactions when they get thrown out because it just goes completely against wanting to push them in the corner and go, well, maybe I shouldn't run because I don't want coach to be mad at me. As opposed to, you know, we had a, a situation this fall, I'm sorry, the spring where I thought a guy could have gone first to third and it would have been a tough play. He made the read. He checked up at second base, and he, he scores eventually, and he comes off. And I said, man, you, you didn't like that read? He goes, Coach, man, my legs are so heavy. If I'd have made that turn, he'd have thrown me out by 60 feet, and you'd have been pissed. And we're up 12-1, by the way. And I'm like, hey, I get it. I understand. And so the, the, the IQ level puts the honus on the player to make that read. And, again, running an 0-2 counts, giving a 3-0 green light, uh, not – shutting down your running game because you don't want to make that last side at third base. I'm telling you, as a coach, we got to move past that a little bit and think a little more creatively. And I'm not saying you're running to outs and you run crazy and you're not worried about running an 80% success clip. Not saying that at all. I'm just saying think a little bit differently and more than that, empower your kids to be athletic. I think you'll be shocked at where they go. They're probably a lot better athletes than we give them credit for. And so what it comes back to is get out of their way. Give them a system that allows them to be aggressive on the bases, to hunt ball and dirts, to have a green light so that they can run when they have something, to hunt certain tips or look into the catcher and hunt certain pitches, teach them how to break down sign systems at, at first base and second base. So they start to really get in on the catcher and they know exactly what's coming. Give them the aggressiveness to try to score from second base and get out of their way. Let them be athletes. Let them play. I do not disagree. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. No, I love that. I love the, the main thing is empowering your athletes to fail and empowering your athletes to but make out. decisions on their own, like, like to be able to make those decisions because at the end of the day, they're their best base coach, man. So, guys, I, I think it's important, too, in the, in the training aspect of it to understand that you're, you're giving them this opportunity because you're teaching them and they're going to have this opportunity to, to have some freedom and learn so that the next time the situation arises in the game, which it definitely will in the bases, um, they'll be a little bit more educated on what they're going to do or not do depending on the situation. I, I honestly think this takes a different style of coach to even teach base running the way we do to be okay with failure. I mean, yeah, you guys were talking 80%, 90%. I honestly feel 90% I'm not doing enough. Yeah, 90% is a great number, but I feel like I'm not doing enough. I like to sit in the 83 to 83 seven range if i'm below 80 we're doing something wrong i'm not picking something up as a coach not teaching something right if i'm over 90 push the envelope a little bit more 
Yeah. No, this is this is great stuff, man. I think just like you said, allowing them to fail, allowing them to make those decisions and being able to um, be their best coach on the base pass is huge. But no, like I said, man, I want to be respectful of y'all's time. You guys took a ton of time out of your day to come on here. Um, this was incredible. I, I really appreciate everybody, one who signed on, to you coaches, man, being a part of this thing. This, is, this fires me up. It's cool to learn from people that are just that, that across the whole world. I mean, me being in Arizona and you guys being all scattered across, being able to still learn from each other and find little wisdom nuggets that we can take on with our day, it fires me up. So, one, I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you. Two, best of luck with everything you've got going with this season. I know it's tough for the athletes. I know it's tough for coaches during this time, but to continue to encourage them and empower them to, to be those leaders that we can as coaches is huge. So, um, thank you guys. And if you need anything, please, if an athlete needs somebody to talk to outside the box, reach out. I'm always here for those guys as well. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks, Austin. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks, Austin. Thank you, guys. Take care. Better, fellas. Austin, thanks, man. We'll see you. Absolutely, Ron. Later, brother.